And what they're doing is they're saying, look, we just don't think a conventional school model is going to serve these kids. Now it's infinitely more expensive. It costs 35000 bucks to serve these kids. And that means we've got to tap into resources from other lines of expenditures. They're looking at money that the, the, the Washington, D.C. or Baltimore would otherwise spend in other ways. And that means that we need to think. If you've got a school, district school, charter school, I don't care, or you've got an educational provider in district, out of district, I don't care, and it is solving a set of needs and it's solving problems that we don't usually solve, it's not enough to say, well, we've got $9,600 per pupil funding, here you go. We've got to start to say, if you're solving problems that other people aren't, how do we configure the available dollars to recognize that? And if you're solving it more cheaply than somebody else, how do we reward you? How do we make sure that cost-effective providers aren't just told, well, that's nice, but are rewarded and encouraged and given a chance to grow? And so for me, that's where the policy piece comes in. It's a whole bunch of the categorical grants and a whole bunch of the rules regarding the ways in which procurement is handled and expenditures are spent. That's where our current framework makes it a whole lot harder for people who want to solve the problem you raise to get their hands dirty doing it. I hope my question isn't too redundant, but I had a, a related question. You mentioned earlier that you think um, you threw out a figure of 50% increase in the number of teachers. And it's my impression that a lot of that increase in personnel is related to special education requirements and statutory requirements for one-on-one -on -one aides and that sort of thing. So I wonder if you could comment on that, please. That, that is exactly right. That is absolutely true. Um, it's also true, for instance, that compared to the early 70s, um, the amount of time teachers spend with kids during their day has fallen on average from about four and a half hours to a little, uh, to about 3.8 or 3.9. So part of it is we've hired more people and then asked them each to do a little less contact time with kids. But a big piece of this uh, is Education for All Handicapped Children Act, um, you know, which followed and, and, and all that it's meant in terms particularly of our requirements for mainstreaming and least restrictive environment. And what this has meant is we have tried to make sure that we have additional staff working with children with special needs in these classroom environments. So you, when I say nationally we have average class size ratios, student-teacher ratios, of about 15 to 1, 15 and a half to 1. People always say, well, wait a minute. I've walked in my kids' school. I don't think I've ever seen a classroom of 15. And part of what's going on is we've got some classes where you've got two or three adults in a room of seven kids and other rooms where you've got 24 or 25 kids with a single adult. And to me, this actually is a nice parallel to the gentleman's question because what happens is we've got these rules on compliance, on here's how you have to staff, whether or not it seems to make any uh, sense, whether or not you're actually serving these kids well for half the price, you're still not allowed to reshuffle those dollars. And so partly what I'm talking about is that if you go all the way back to the 80s when this notion of reinventing government came into vogue, uh, Gable and Osborne wrote this book that everybody made their Bible of Department of Motor Vehicles and the rest. And they said, look, we're going to bring smart 20th century management into government. And smart 20th century management says, we now know some things about outcomes. And if we can measure outcomes, it allows us to get out of the business of telling you everything about your business. It allows us to ease up on the regulation, the red tape, and as long as you're getting the job done, we're not going to tell you how to do it. The problem is, as we've brought accountability in education, we've only half learned the lesson. As we've learned to count things, we've very rarely then done the flip side of that and unwound for everybody who's succeeding in terms of outcomes and cost-effective outcomes. We've failed to unwind all the rules about how they go about their work. And that's actually, I think, well, you know, one of the things that gets confusing about the charter environment is, you know, as was mentioned, charters have a mixed record. Absolutely. I'm a huge charter fan, but I'll be the first to say, on average, I'm not at all convinced that the average charter is better than the average district school. But what, there's 5,000 charters out there, and what the 500 kind of the cream of the crop are doing is showing us how when you get people who want to solve problems and they've got the support they need, that there's much better ways to do what we're doing with hard-to-serve kids than districts are allowed to in so many cases. So we focus a lot on what's the right practice. How do we push it into those classrooms? And I'm saying that's actually maybe starting the wrong place. The right place to start is what are we trying to achieve? How do we start to selectively unwind these rules and then let people work with us to identify the practices that will make sense in the new environments? Mr. Hess, thank you for everything that you brought to our minds today. Um, I agree with so much of what you advocate for, but I, I want to ask you a question sort of about policy, and I want to go back to a couple of questions ago. 
and come back to school finance here in the state of Ohio. And basically, the model of property tax and the electorate voting upon it. Because we can, you know, it, it's like business, but then it's not quite like business. You know, buy the product, I don't want to buy your product, I'll buy another product. But my concern is parents. Um, we're talking about an entire state and policy change, and we have high-performing schools and low-performing schools. In the high-performing schools, you have a parent that says, not my kid, I don't want 35, they're doing just fine this way, I'm not voting for that, and that's how policy gets changed. So what are your thoughts on, uh, on, on that subject, please? No, I think it's a gr uh, couple things going on. One, uh, and here's another thing I'll say that you, 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 you never hear, but this is, this is a nice thing about not having a real job. You can say all kinds of stuff. <laughs> um, I think the focus on the achievement gap has been really problematic in important ways. Um, I think it's been valuable in certain ways, obviously, that it has, got, it has generated real and sustained attention to the degree to which we are massively ill-treating uh, low-income and minority children in this country, and that's all been all to the good. But I think it has also wreaked two really pr troubling consequences. One, that it has made it too easy for us to shove to the back of our minds the needs of students who aren't that population. So we don't spend a lot of, in the last decade, we haven't spent a lot of time and energy really thinking seriously about how do you help kids who are already proficient or who are doing well excel. We talk about STEM, we do, we do these particular programs, but this isn't part and parcel of the school mission. What happens is you walk into any number of elementary or middle schools or high schools, the folks who've gotten religion, everything in that school is, or is organized around identifying where are kids short of the bar, targeting our best teachers and our resources, helping those kids get to the bar. Oh, and we've also got a STEM program. And I think that actually is really problematic because for me, the purpose of democratic schooling is to help each of our children uh, fulfill their natural abilities. And I worry that, you know, we focused on part of the population to the exclusion of the other. But the other big issue, the practical issue, is that by doing this, we have essentially made school reform something that legislators from suburban districts and the suburban parents do when they're feeling a little guilty. And so our strategy for school reform is exactly the Great Society strategy from the mid-60s, which blew up massively and led to the Reagan Revolution, which is our strategy is because these aren't your kids, nonetheless, you should feel really guilty and worry about them and want to see lots of resources devoted to people who don't live in your neighborhood and aren't your problem. And I got to say, in American society, I mean, Tocqueville caught this, uh, you know, almost two centuries ago, that is not the way that things tend to get done. America tends to run on enlightened self-interest. And we can keep lecturing suburban parents, well, the eco economy is going to require that we do this, but that's actually a little downfield for them. So I think part of the solution here is thinking about how we make these solutions and these opportunities much more concrete for your day-to-day -day suburban family. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a special forum featuring Rick Hess, Director of Education Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute for Public Policy Research. Thank you, Mr. Hess. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.